Great. Um, we have now about 45 minutes uh, to try to solve big issues in the world, isn't it? And of course, I am always looking into the book of my uh, hero. His name is, of course, Nelson Mandela. He was a very special person. And what he did, of course, was to show us that the impossible, or what seemed to be impossible, is actually possible. Uh, it was possible to find negotiated settlement in South Africa, despite all the problems that we now still are seeing. And he said at a point, like slavery uh, and apartheid, poverty is not natural. It is man-made and it can be overcome and eradicated by the actions of human beings. How many of you have seen that before? I always go back to Nelson Mandela when I need some courage and some inspiration. And there is a whole book with his quote. Uh, his way uh, of handling very difficult issues is important to remember as we are looking into the challenges of the future and the present. So it's great to have you here on stage. Please interact with each other. Please feel also you here in the audience to interact. And I wanted to start with you to say, just to ask you for about, don't keep longer than three minutes, because if we do seven times three is 21 minutes. Uh, what is it that you're bringing home with you? If we start there, what is it that have engaged you, encouraged you, uh, made you rise your eyebrows and think, yeah, that's something new that these students or what you've heard uh, that I can bring with me home. And I start over there with you. Okay. Thank you very <laughs> much. Um, can, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, so it's been a remarkable uh, conference. I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for putting this on and for inviting me. Uh, I've learned a lot during these last couple of days. Here's basically what I've learned. Um, for the first 20 years of my career, uh, the work that we did was so truncated on agriculture. It was all about you know, prices of agricultural commodities, uh, marketing boards and so forth. And over the last two days, we've been talking about, uh, in, it's, it's a very holistic approach uh, now, integrating food, energy, water, land in, a, in an integrated framework. And the title of this uh, conference really illustrates that, the, 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 the synergism between rural landscapes and urban landscapes. So. Uh, c congratulations, I think that we're on the right track. A lot of this is really driven by resource scarcity and by population growth in the developing world. Uh, these issues marrying the demographic issues with development issues are going to be increasingly uh, salient for us as researchers and for policymakers. So all of the challenges that strike me that we're facing both in uh, the developing world and the developed world are, are becoming increasingly similar. They're about how to utilize resources in a sustainable way. And that word sustainability, I can't um, overemphasize the importance of that one uh, in this discourse. So Thank you. let me stop there. Thank mm -hmm. you, Dave. Thank you, Ed, please. Yeah. yeah, and I would like to congratulate everybody who has attended this two-day conference and to the Agri4D conference series, because I really think that this one has sort of both broadened and deepened and sort of been maturing the, the agriculture research for development concept. As Thomas, as you are saying, it has been going across the sectors. We have really been bringing in land, water, cities. We have been bringing like from agriculture, forestry, fishery. It's been going from smallholder to large scale, from public to private. And we have been also discussing um, capacity development uh, and other issues, and very much also how to link sort of research policy and practice. Uh, so I think this has sort of really been um, uh, very interesting and, and many steps forward. Uh, and really what I think as a take home message, uh, and very much to people maybe based in the universities in, in these countries where I'm coming from as well, is that it's really illustrated the need to work across sectors, work across disciplines, and really the need to, to, to work on agricultural research for development platforms with multiple stakeholders on specific themes, topics, problems. 
because just sitting in the department or the academic environment with one subject at a time, however many strategies we write about interdisciplinarity, we need to form the platforms. It needs to, to be facilitated to really drive research in the holistic way as actually the development work uh, is progressing. And here we have a lot to learn for the, for the international collaboration and a lot to learn, and it's completely necessary to work together with colleagues in, in, in all different countries, because it's first being on the ground, being in the different contexts, that we can formulate what are really the issues, what, where are the knowledge gaps, because sometimes it's more policy gaps. So research is mainly needed to bridge where we have the knowledge gaps, and also to synthesize, of course, existing knowledge. So really, thank you very much, working all together, but also drive our sort of universities and the ones providing funding for, for these platforms, because we, we need to be able to, to work together sort of for real, not only in conferences. Mm. Thank you. And now it's Dave. Sorry, I said wrong. No, sorry. That's all right. That's all right, yeah. Um, well, it's, it's always a great conference when on the last day you can't make your mind up which session to go into, I think, <laughs> because you could find something interesting in all of them. And uh, we've, had some, we've had some great keynotes, but I think there's been a lot of energy unleashed in the, the sessions where we've had really well put together programs of papers that are thought-provoking, they're stimulating, they've given rise to a lot of good conversations. So I think uh, the, the word that sums it up for me is cross-fertilization of ideas that we've all enjoyed the last few days. And um, yeah, I feel aquaculture and this idea of managing aquatic foods, um, I think it's, it's helped me think about how we really need to bring them into these broader food systems, these food landscapes. And uh, thank you all for that, because many of you uh, through conversations have helped clarify some of those thoughts in my mind. I think uh, going forward, you know, often quoted, perhaps an urban legend uh, that, that Pei has to add to his list, that uh, aquaculture is the fastest growing food production system in the world. Well, it's, of course, it's coming from quite a small base in many parts of the world, and there's lots of people who wouldn't go near a fish, let alone eat one. So there's a lot of work to do there, and I think... Uh, something else that I think is encouraging that this conference has really embraced the idea of, of value chains, that's not new, but looking at food from a consumption as well as a production angle, because if we're going to have sustainable production and intensification, we've got to look at what we eat and why we eat it as much as how mm. it's being grown. Mm. So aquaculture is and will uh, increasingly and necessarily become integrated into landscapes um, and scientists of all types have to realize that. Some of them will be more urban and some will be more rural. We realize there's big uh, cross-linkages between them. And, um, and of course, that reflects not just the hydraulic linkages that water imposes on farming in water, but also the fact of the, the roles of people uh, as producers and consumers and everyone in between. So right. thank you. Thank you so much. Please go ahead, Pei. Yeah, that's the fourth time this year that I'm in Sweden. Uh, either there's something fundamentally wrong with me or something fundamentally right with Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't been in Germany at all this year, and I'm, I'm a German. Um, I, uh, for me, the most interesting in this particular conference was how diffuse the boundaries between the rural and urban are. It's, it, I think Nagisti mentioned it, um, the comparison with these um, official boundaries with the population numbers reconfirm it. Everything what Tom said when he described how the urban folks are buying land in rural areas, not only that they maybe have family inheritance there, but it's, it's all getting so diffuse. And I think that our traditional research approaches where we are trying to put it always in these nice categories of rural agriculture and peri-urban and urban, that's obsolete. We should, we should think out of these boxes and we should really adopt these more modern concepts of city region food systems or food sheds, which I mentioned, and or food environment, which was in our session, um, to, yeah, to think out of the box and to accept the complexity. I mean, fun out of Luke's definition of, um, of urban agriculture, which is really complex, but it is complex. The urbanization challenge and urban food security are really complex challenges, and they require different new approaches of research. 
And I think that's the challenge we have to accept, not sticking so much to what we did in the past. So it's something there for those who have been in the business for a very long time, and some, something for those who are stepping into research on these very, very important A things. lot what we can do. Yeah, a lot together and constantly being open for, for new ideas and changes. Please look, what is your conclusion here? For We start with the conclusion, yeah, we do it a different way. <laughs> yeah, I was very impressed by the, the general engineering of this conference and, and the care that people took in, in crafting their presentations and organizing the panels. I mean, uh, bravo, you know, it's, it's, it's really uh, uh, a model to, to take home and, uh, and, and particularly also, I shouldn't forget the time management, I mean, which has been excellent. <laughs> so we actually get to do... Uh, yeah, she, yeah, it's five stars to Marika and others as well. Um, the, I think, I think the, the conference lends us a basis to open up to a number of things. One is to reach out to other disciplines, um, the non-usual suspects um, in, in agricultural sciences, uh, particularly as... Uh, we look into the more intimate interactions between agriculture and built-up urban environments or environments with higher densities of people. Uh, I would mention engineers, uh, specialists in law, um, the, the regulate, regulatory um, system really has to change and adapt, and it's a major break on the the explosion of, uh, of new approaches. Um, architects, landscape architects, uh, working with a human and animal health specialist, for instance, uh, in the area of uh, livestock, uh, urban planning, certainly. So there are new, and I would, I would even include, you know, ICTs, the, the, the rooftop, the rooftop uh, businesses that are um, making the news in Montreal, Canada, um, are being developed by, by guys in their 30s with uh, their telecommunication engineers. Um, and uh, of course, they're, they're not working alone, but this is the kind of, this kind of uh, expertise that, that really is going to change the way we uh, design and operate agriculture as we look over you know, the next 50 years. Our cities in 50 years from now, 100 years from now, will look, they will still have ag agriculture, but uh, that agriculture probably will look very differently. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, need, we need to en envision how things are going to look like in 50 years from now and uh, what we need in terms of capacities to get, to, to, to get there. Um, there's Become also, also th there's an enormous potential um, for the prototyping, the testing of, of new technologies to um, have a greater reach into the business sector. And it would be really interesting to think of engaging more of these people in the actual project, implement your research project implementation, interfacing with the business sector and interfacing also with the with the government sector. I mean, uh, Anthony was saying, you know, how much how much this is a, a challenge, but it's absolutely essential. Someone was sitting saying the city government is 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 a critical um, intermediary. It's a critical convener of of all the parties involved to do things. And Stop I think there. with Magnus, we're thinking. Stop yeah? there. So we come back. Yes. Okay. Uh, your three minutes are over now. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thing, Just yeah. remember that. <laughs> yeah. What you're going to say is because we're going to come back to this. Okay. Thank you, Anthony. No, thank you very much, and I thank the organizers for inviting me. I mean, it has been a pleasure being here, first time in Sweden. Um, thanks to Eva, uh, Eva for linking me up with uh, with, with you all. Uh, to the students, I think one thing that inspired me in life is that. Uh, when I look at all the professionals trying to really make a difference to a continent that has got a lot of potential, but that potential is not being taken uh, 
care of, I say, I feel very, I mean, that comfort that I'm not alone. Because there are times that I am discussing with policymakers, trying to show them that the evidence says, or the evidence is suggesting that we take a different path. And then the policymaker will say, I don't think that's right. So you find that I think evidence-based policy making is very key and I think to the researchers, to the scientists who are spending a lot of time trying to find solutions to these problems, I think is very key and I think uh, we need to encourage this north-south interactions more. I think uh, capacity building is very key. We need to have sustainable capacity building because uh, some approaches don't work very well. I think uh, I've always told Tom, I think when he was in Zambia, that one of the policymakers said, we will listen to you, but we won't listen to you. The moment you leave the office, that's the end. So they will listen, hmm. but once you leave the office, that's it. So you need local people who know how to really take that stick and continuously talk to the policymakers to be able to change, to change so the things. So the constant presence of pressure. Yes, so far, that um, you can evidence. only do mm. when you build mm. the locals so that they can perform the job when you are not Thank there. you, Anthony. Thank mm. you. Magister, please. Okay, mm. Thank you, yeah. Uh, it was really enlightening, uh, very nice to see many people from different parts of the world and from different age category, even though I'm much more inclined to, to like the youth and the young and energetic people, and we are having a lot of them, uh, which is very good. It gives hope and, uh, because the potential is in them, the future is in the youth and in the young generations, and it's good to have them here. Yeah. Uh, we've been listening a lot we discussed it from a very large landscape approach uh, the framework to solve all these global challenges uh, but we zoomed in also to the capacity and capability of individuals to make uh, as as change uh, agents to make to make change uh, we heard a lot about uh, robust science that we need more and more of the science but we also heard about if science is not contextualized, maybe it brings more harm than, than good things. So we need to, 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 to really have reflections on the context and to, to try to respond uh, uh, the local needs. And again, science capacity building of young generations, that's the potential and I hope we'll do more of that. Mm. Uh, of course, where do you start? We have now a beautiful kind of compressed idea of what we have gained over the last few days and by exchanging ideas. Um, I would like just for one minute, turn around to your friend, even if you don't know each other, and say what is two sentences of what you gained. Just bring that, it might also raise some questions. Please, go ahead, one minute. Talk to each other. <laughs> so yes, now you can also do that. <laughs> Okay, that was a very That's short a one minute, but I think we are made to communicate with each other and to listen, of course, and I just want to share with you this picture. Uh, also by a very uh, famous um, cartoonist and political um, um, commentator in South Africa. Uh, looking down here are the uh, aliens on our beautiful planet and whatever it is that transformed their planet. This is what we were hoping in the 90s after Mandela was released and the whole world was looking at South Africa as an example. And for me, South Africa is a microcosmos. Everything that is good in the world, you can see there. And everything that is a, a problem, you can also see there. Uh, so the challenges are enormous. We have about <coughs> 60 million people 
uh, enforced displacement at the moment due to conflict or climate change. Um, so considering that, um, we have heard so many beautiful ideas on, on, you know, from how we can enhance production, how we can meet each other, you know, many good ideas. And I would like to ask the panel, from what you have heard, how do you want to upscale some of these ideas? And I know that Tom wanted to talk about that, but I would like some of you others to also engage in that. Mm -hmm. Some of the ideas you heard, <coughs> how do you make them profitable, if that's what is needed, uh, to create food in the future? I might simplify it too much, but you are most welcome to draw me back into, li into line. So who would like to start? Is it? Yes, yes can you can just now. <coughs> and, and Tom will take over, I'm, I'm sure. sure. Or mm. You will take over. Um, Tom brought this uh, interesting idea, which was new for me, or not idea, but the facts that um, people in cities, especially older people in cities, are buying this land outside. And they have the idea that then they want to hand it over to the children, so that the children actually go back into farming. Now, we know that the children who are once already in the city hardly want to go out. And so, but still to make it attractive to them, the next step is that we understand the types of business models which could make them agricultural entrepreneurs, so that in principle they do this for Tom, what you call telephone. Telephone uh, farming, yeah. Yeah, so it's that they develop some kind of entrepreneurship. And I asked Tom, Tim, do we have already a catalog of these business models which actually can engage the youth and can make them this type of entrepreneurs to go back to agriculture? <coughs> and um, he says, you, you're working on this. Could you, could you elaborate a bit on this, Tom? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a uh, flow of people where the majority of people are flowing out of rural areas. Um, but these are generally poor people with low skills. And at the same time, there's a flow back into agriculture, as, as you mentioned. Uh, and these tend to be more capitalized people. They'll have finance degrees or business administration degrees, and they're getting involved mm -hmm. in farming on a bigger scale. Uh, and slowly but surely, uh, they're changing the, com the face of what African agriculture increasingly looks like. Not in terms of the numbers of people involved, but in the terms of their impact on the sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think it's an, it's an important trend to keep mindful of. Now, uh, there are all sorts of um, questions about social disruption and, and, and problems that they might be creating to, to you know, there's, there's something like an enclosure movement happening in many parts of Africa right now, where the commons, uh, the, the, the customary lands are quickly, you know, being snapped up as fast as possible. So there's an enclosure movement happening at where land has value. And this is probably going to intensify the pressure on poor rural people uh, I think the data is showing us that there's an increasing, r almost landless, v virtually landless class of people who are becoming ag wage laborers uh, and dependent on, you know, bigger farms for employment. And, and some of those people they're becoming dependent on are these sons and daughters of wealthy businessmen who are investing in land and becoming entrepreneurial farmers. And it's happening very rapidly. Mm. So. So I think part of our challenge is to not only document it, but figure out what to do about it. Because most African governments are, I think, quite supportive of this. And, um, you know, the terminology that they use when they talk about this is we're finally getting uh, an entrepreneurial class of farmers. Uh, we're moving into the 21st century. Uh, this is exactly the way things should be happening, uh, according to many, many politicians. Who else would like to add to that? Yeah, for me, I think I, we are not following the normal path of transformation in Africa. I think uh, we have a different path now that is happening. So that's why you find that uh, these emergent farmers are people who are in urban areas. They never grew up in the rural areas. 
So I think we have to re realize that this is happening. We should not see them as a big threat. I'm stepping on Tom's uh, feet. Hmm. Uh, they are not a threat. What we need is policies to make sure that we control what these investments they are making, mm -hmm. as well as I think yeah. have strategies for the smaller guys who have aspirations to become more commercialized, but they don't have the means to, to, to do it, and also take advantage of the large scale uh, investments and see how they can be beneficial to the development process. Staying with Africa, so who would like to yes? Hmm? Yeah. yeah, I would like to broaden a little bit f from Sub-Saharan Africa also to, yeah. to other parts of the Global South, mm. because I, there is a structural change going on, or indications of structural change going on in the Asian agriculture, for example, where many times <coughs> the policies, <coughs> the governments are, are a bit stronger and, and the natural policies are a bit stronger or it's it's, it's more easy with research actually to, to influence policies. So I think like a South-South exchange and dialogue would be really mm -hmm. necessary mm -hmm. and, yeah. and very useful. And mm -hmm. I'm sure also with Latin America that I know uh, yeah. less about and have less experience from. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to, to raise that so we don't only yeah. see the Sub-Saharan Af yeah. Africa case, but actually learn between the, the different parts of the South. Mm. Good. That's, That's good. good. Yeah, important um, to raise. The, the, the idea of the... Uh, Break the, the enclosures is a, it has a resonance, I think, in parts of Asia where there's a similar grab for <coughs> aquatic resources mm. and uh, the role of inter influential people, people with more power locally to, to control that. I think there's, there's, mm. there's signs of that. Um, I think the other point about the, the two-way traffic, about um, people with very different types of people going back to rural mm. areas, that was, that's, there's been some interesting evidence from that from the 97 Asian um, crisis, whereby many people who were quite comfortable in the city and in what they thought was a comfortable urban lifestyle actually went back to their rural homes yeah. rather than just visiting to try and make a living. And I think, uh, I, I don't think we've looked at that enough. It's probably a good time to go back and, and study that in some detail. But for sure, they would have gone back with different attitudes, different needs and different skills. Um, and mm -hmm. I think it probably mm -hmm. um, in itself changed the way uh, many rural areas actually, actually worked. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it, these are dynamic, aren't they? Of course, things have settled down since then. Things have got back to normal. Um, but these ideas of rural and urban, there's, uh, there's, the, some of the geographers have done good work on this, I think. And mm -hmm. uh, we need to... Yeah, bring in uh, and, and think about that more, perhaps, these other experts. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, migration is a very important part. Of course, historically, land has been very, very much part of, of uh, uh, an elite also to make uh, a living with, uh, with um, cheap labor, I mean, not at, not at least in, in Central and South America. But I just want to uh, continue with a question here from the audience, staying with Africa for a moment. Uh, and it is um, to Anthony, but you can all have a listen to this. Uh, it, uh, the importance, the importation of food to Africa, as we've heard, uh, uh, is it, or is it only related? The important is the importation of food as a result of as, as a result of shortfall of food in sub-Saharan Africa. Or is it also related to multinational companies' interest in agriculture and food dumps uh, from global north? If that is the case, can research help Africa to resist these imports that harm African agriculture by making local produce uh, more expensive? So, you know, <coughs> finding a market, it's been up on, in the presentations, but the, uh, to add to this complexity of, of the importation of food to Africa. Just to stay with that for a moment. <coughs> no, thank you very much. I think there was a graph that I didn't uh, find time to talk about where you find that uh, if you look at the grain market in, in, in Zambia, for example, because agriculture in, in the region is, is rain-fed. So you find that production goes up and down. So that, and with the increase in, in climate change, shocks, <coughs> you find that at times we do have shortfalls and and we need to import 
food. But in often times, I think we have enough, but for food to move from one place to the other, you find that it's even more costly than maybe importing it from, 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 from uh, uh, I mean, deep sea, deep sea imports. So, I mean, there's, at times there's dumping, yeah, yes, but I think it's always a chicken and egg. Uh, <coughs> do we close our borders so that we don't uh, get cheap food for the consumers? first and promote these uh, our local uh, farmers or we make sure that the farmers get the right technology to be able to increase productivity because when they increase productivity you find that we may not need to import as much as we are importing now so investments in infrastructure is very key we should be able to move food from Zimbabwe to Zambia, Zambia to Malawi, Malawi to Kenya cheaply. Right now to move grain from Zambia, which is a surplus currently, to, 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 uh, to the Horn of Africa, it's almost $250, just a metric ton, to move just one metric ton of grain. Mm -hmm. So you find that it's very expensive to utilize the food that we have so it's not about shortfalls. We have the food, but it's very costly to move it. So I think realigning our public expenditure to ensure that we invest in infrastructure that can make us connected is very key. Thank mm. you. Would like to add Go ahead. Yeah, in, in part it also requires supporting regulation, supporting a um, enabling environment. Um, there are many food sectors which are quite strong in Africa but have been destroyed by imports, like in, in Ghana, the, the poultry sector. The poultry sector was tremendously strong, very well developed, um, but the sheep frozen chicken from Brazil are completely taking over, and these chicken are fed with sheep GM maize, <coughs> and they reach the Ghana market at a lower price, and so the government has to do something, and I think in, in Nigeria they did it, so they closed the border. And they said, no, you shaking, you stay out. Yeah. Mm. The, the, we are staying a bit, 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 bit with Africa, but I wanted to know if you can interact on that one. We're talking about policy, we're talking about politicians who are making decisions. And you say, you know, we listen to you, and then once you've gone out of the room, we, do our, we take our own decisions. Are there any experience, like for you, for example, Ingrid, who have worked both in... Uh, Asia and in, in, in Africa, where you see how to influence uh, policy uh, and decision makers, politicians, to have a more long-term approach when it comes to food security and farming, whether it's rural or urban, and uh, food security. Do you have any ideas or good examples of how to influence not beyond the next election? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> I mean, it's difficult to say, but as I was pointing out yesterday, I think to really build on the global agreements, bringing them down to regional agreements, making them to national commitments uh, to fulfill the SDGs, to, to really do things in one way could go beyond elections. Mm -hmm. Especially <laughs> when you agree with your neighboring countries and start to put pressure on each other to actually deliver on those promises. So, so I think that, that is really a way, because when things are up in the air, when things are out in the media, when things are up in, in meetings, most governments mm -hmm. feel that pressure mm -hmm. and then actually want to, to deliver. So, so yeah. I, I think that that is one way, and I think that is where we as researchers from national and international organizations can come in, because that's where we can f feed in facts based on evidence. And then as we discussed also yesterday with the with the public-private people partnership, with people movements, with different groups, keep pushing, keep pushing. So, so actually, they really have to fulfill the promises. So to add to that, do you, as researchers, uh, scientists, have any specific um, responsibility? <laughs> yeah, just uh, many of us here either work in the CGIAR, this, um, this association of international agricultural research or worked or work still yeah and um, we are today no longer paid for producing research outputs we are paid for producing research outcomes mm -hmm. we are paid actually for impact 
And so we have these days a high obligation and we are under the same pressure to think on the impact pathways of whatever we do. <coughs> if we don't have a good impact pathway, our research is no longer funded. Mm. So the pressure is there and to convince the policymakers, it's not easy because they have little money which they have to allocate and there are so many different stakeholders. One wants that the money goes into the churches, another wants into the educational sector, someone else wants the roads and we are lobbying for maybe more uh, infrastructure for agriculture or cool houses or something like this. It's, it's a very hard, tough process with a lot of competition for limited resources which needs these permanent dialogues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You add to that? Yeah, I I'd like to add... Uh, policy influence, I mean, talking with, uh, uh, as you said, trying to influence a policy, you have to have a kind of a window of opportunity uh, to make that change happen at the right time uh, and with the right message. And at times we can find the right time but not the right message and where a lot of our policymakers might not have the exact tool and we haven't fed them with concrete knowledge uh, to make that happen. Uh, but if situations come together and if there are windows of opportunity, a lot of things can happen actually. Mm -hmm. And we, IFS, has been working to, to, with, with policymakers to, to change the, the, the policy of scientific infrastructure. Uh, and we were lucky enough when we were doing a lot of these uh, interventions, uh, Kenya during that time, it was making a, a change in their policy on science, technology and innovation and they're really looking how to do this one. So there was a window of opportunity where immediately science can fit in into that, uh, that gap and change can happen. Mm -hmm. So it is complex, it is, it is iterative, but at times it's also not bringing all the tools together at the right time and the right moment. Of course, we have the sustainability goals and there is a commitment from world leaders, yet, you know, you are actually saying here on the stage that it is difficult because we need to produce for certain specific targets. Uh, and, but, but you would like to work together. Would you like to fill in on that one? How, mm -hmm. how do we go further? Mm -hmm. Give these, all these students ideas and yourself as well. Okay, so Mar Marike, I, I would like to challenge the, the question actually. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Sometimes, w well, think, let's think about this kind of holistically. When, when we look at some major policies that were adopted, some major changes adopted in, in, our, in our own countries, how did it happen? Uh, was it that research influenced policy makers and then all of a sudden they sort of said, okay, you're right, we'll, we'll change? Or was it more of a case of <clears throat> mainstream opinion on an issue changing? And once mainstream views on an issue changed, then it puts pressure on the politicians to change. Mm. Uh, I look in my country about the position on, um, you know, uh, position towards, uh, well, gender, many gender issues in our, our country were not shaped by politicians, they were shaped by public. Um, views on, on um, uh, legalizing marijuana, that, there's a perfect example of the uh, public opinion basically getting out in front of politicians. Um, uh, so, so to a large extent, I think it's incumbent on us as researchers to try to do research that we feel is the research that needs to be done to shape public opinion. Mm -hmm. And by shaping public opinion, then this will indirectly have impacts and you know where there's low-hanging fruit and policymakers are really coming and mm -hmm. saying please help us we really want answers to this, and let's take advantage of that yeah. exactly. but for the most part yeah. it doesn't happen that way mm -hmm. and it have uh, so we need to be shaping the demand for research mm -hmm. and not just being totally demand driven and and responding to what uh, the you know what policymakers may may say we have a role I was going to say, I think uh, policy change takes time. I think uh, uh, the issue of having a critical mass of people appreciating evidence-based policy, I think, is very important. I think I can give you an example of what we did as IAPRI. I think trying to change the fertilizer 
policy in Zambia has taken years. Uh, we are trying to change the maize policy as well. It is taking time. But what we have done is we have said, okay, we have been talking to the same people over and over again and nothing is changing. So we changed the strategy a little bit. We started going to the chiefs, the ones that communicate with the people and say, here is the evidence. Hmm. If you want farmers to benefit from public resources, this is what we recommend. We went to the parliamentarians. We say, this is the evidence. We invite the media, because the media usually writes what sells. Usually when I say I present, you find that the headline is usually what I didn't say. They want to sell their papers. We invite the media, we train the media to write for progress. So you find that uh, I think over the years, that strategy is, I think is starting to bear some fruits. And I think it's important that for everyone to appreciate that policy change is not easy. Hmm. It takes time, but we can make baby steps. As long as people are right, I mean, when the technocrats write in the minister's speech to say something that is good, we think that's a positive uh, progress. So um, it also a matter of getting the research out, your conclusions and being able to spread them to wider public. That's one of the questions here. Uh, how much can researchers work together with civil society and people's movement, for example, on the ground to push for civil rights? I mean, the right to food, for example, is such, such a one. We are sort of coming. We have about 10 minutes left at the most. I see you would like to, to answer this. Do you want to follow on that, or shall we move on to the next topic? No, I, I was still a little bit on at this end, because we discussed the same question at the Stockholm Water Week. And um, there in the sanitation sector, what changed policy very often that were epidemics. Yes. And this brings me to the point, and that's, I think, important for the research, that whenever you want to tell a policymaker what is important. You cannot just say and say that's important. You have to say, what are the returns on investment? What would happen? What are the costs if you don't go in this direction? So to bring the cost functions in, I think is critical if you want to push for any point. Hmm. Well, I mean, that's obvious. Some modern people say, you know, you won't go into farming if you don't can make a surplus or some kind of, of uh, um, better living out of it today, right. apart if, if you're not absolutely forced to do farming for your daily, daily sustainable for, for survival. Um, it leads me, if anybody would like to ask a question right now with the microphone? Otherwise, I have one more question. It is really about um, food waste. There was a question. Where are you? Can't see. Do you have a microphone? There you are. Um, well, you were starting out with a, with a really interesting discussion that I wanted to um, also talk about. Uh, but we've been talking about uh, the public-private uh, and people's partnerships. Um, but and, and we've uh, talked about how important it is to involve the local people. But uh, I still see... Um, kind of a gap between research and the people, the 80% of uh, smallholder farmers' opinions. Uh, how, how are their voices going to be... How can you, um, through your organizations and institutions, uh, promote their uh, voices? Um, that's what I wanted mm -hmm. to know. <coughs> yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. How to get more participation and promote the needs of those who are furthest down? <coughs> yeah, I think, I mean, we, we need to invite the, the stakeholders we want to discuss with to the table. Because n now we are researchers here, but I also know that there are people in the audience coming from civil society organizations and others. So, so if you're still here and want to say something, I think you should. 
Because, I mean, we can always say that we do the research for, for the people uh, and, and, and so on, usually mm -hmm. on public money. But really, to get the dialogue, yeah. we need to have everybody around the table. Yeah, I, I think that's the key. And that was what I, I meant with forming research for development platforms with the mm -hmm. stakeholders that, uh, that have a stake in, 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 the, in, in the things that we are investigating or where we want to try to change policy. Because mm -hmm. that, is, that is how we can get the drive. Because that is really sort of, it cannot happen with research only. We are one stakeholder mm -hmm. of many. I agree. Would you like to add there, some one of you? Yeah, I think for us, uh, we, we say the voice of the smallholder farmers are the surveys that we do. Because we carry out uh, rural livelihood surveys uh, once every three, four years. And we take that data and analyze it and get stories out of it that we use to try to inform policies. So I think what we have not done very well is to try to communicate those findings back to the people, I mean to the farmers themselves. What we have done is communicate mostly with the policy mm. makers. I think if pressure has to come from the bottom, we have to communicate the evidence back to the farmer so that they can be pushing for mm. better, mm. better, better policies, so. Yeah, I would like to add there, please. Yeah, no, I, I was thinking about the Latin American and Caribbean experience with the uh, municipal decentralization of some of the responsibilities from national to, to municipal governments. It has become much easier, I would say, to obtain um, fairly rapid engagement on part of the local governments uh, for trying out new initiatives. And in, very, in many instances, Governments are risk averse, politically. I mean, if something backfires, the next election is coming, it's not looking very good. Um, so in some cases, uh, in several cases actually, where we've worked uh, with local governments of large cities, um, it's a councillor of one particular district that's been allowed to experiment, to dry run something and see if it works I mean, in the case of Lima, Peru, it was with three different districts. And the ones who are at the basis of this dynamic are our local community mm -hmm. our grassroots uh, groups, local communities, women's groups, uh, very small business groups, uh, sometimes youth sports organizations. The youth want to do something for their neighborhood. Um, so that stratum of, of civil society organization is, is very important. <coughs> I mean, everybody talks about the national program of urban agriculture in Cuba, but the, the Cuba w government was pressed by people that were starting to, mm -hmm. to do things mm -hmm. on their own. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's not Fidel Castro that came down with the bright idea. I mean, people were really doing it anyway. Yeah. And the government saw politically a capital opportunity to, to do something more systematic. So um, sometimes it's very hard to to enter from the national, and particularly in the, the context of urban peri-urban agriculture, where you're dealing with cities, uh, local governments are much closer to their electorate. Um, it's easier to convene stakeholders around the table and to assign responsibilities and monitor on the ground, and the press is there. Mm -hmm. The local <coughs> press is there. So it's a very different theater than trying to influence the, the minister of a particular sector. Mm -hmm. Lime Ministries. And eventually, I mean, the case of Brazil with the Fome Zero program nationwide, it went ballistic. But that built on a number of experiences at the metropolitan level. So the, the way it has worked more effectively for us has been from the bottom up. Mm. I'll stop here. Mm. Yes. Uh, uh, just coming from, from another direction, um, I agree with all of that. But I think uh, mm. we, we really have to bear in mind the, the role of the media mm. uh, in shaping public opinion. Yes. It, it's, uh, it's very potent. It has different forms in different contexts. Um, there's a, the conventional media and the social okay. media. And I think uh, if we're going to move public opinion towards uh, the direction we want, we've got to engage and engage in a way that's understandable and accessible. Yeah. Mm. True. And that leads me, we're going to make a conclusion soon here, but, but we could talk for at least another three, four hours, I would imagine. Um, at least, but we're coming to a situation in the world of this beautiful planet of ours uh, where more people soon are living in big cities. Mm -hmm. 
you know, they need food every day. We talked about this now for two days, so you talked about it for years, many of you. At the same time, we have a surplus of food actually on this planet. So much food is wasted. So how do we deal with this? And how do we deal with the fact that if people are not being fed in the cities, we will soon have a group, or we still have in some areas, groups of young people who are very dissatisfied and very hungry, which can create big problems. Uh, you know, this, this, is, uh, not a, this is a challenge, obviously. So you said the media, we need to be able to, 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 to put, take our findings to a larger public. We need to be able to talk to policymakers. We need to talk to the local politicians who are actually those who can change. Are there anything more we can do? How do we end on a positive note? And I will just use this last... No, that was not the one I wanted to use. Is it not here? There it is. Also Mandela. Mm -hmm. It always seems impossible <coughs> until it is done. But I think all of you have said it is possible, mm -hmm. you know, despite the fact that we have enormous challenges. So would you like to go the round like this and, mm -hmm. and try to end on something about the... Just the following that, yeah? yeah. It's up to you. Yeah, uh, I, I think <laughs> we, 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 we are very good in, in talking about challenges, about problems, uh, but maybe we have to change the tone to say what has worked so far mm. in terms of creating mm. uh, positive things that we can learn. Mm. Uh, I mean, as scientists, we have the tendency to problematize. As journalists uh, as well. Uh, as journalists, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But how can we pick up the good lessons and make them owned by many people? How can we learn from successful stories uh, and use these successful stories to tell a message, to change the attitude, the mindset, to make it happen? that bad things can also change. So I would say to, to return from problematizing, but to, to take cases which are successful and make them uh, shared widely. So in your work and in our work, we look, we look at the positives as well, and we lift them as a good example. Thank you yeah. very much. Anthony, what are you going to do? I think uh, in terms of limiting waste, I think we have to think about uh, value addition and uh, Processing, I think there is very limited processing, I think, being done by most uh, smallholder farmers and also investment in storage and other things. But in terms of, I think, uh, positives, I think I like that because I have participated with uh, is it Agra. There is a book <coughs> they produce every year. It's called The Status of the Agricultural Sector. So it's a yearly publication. And in that publication, they force the writers to bring out the success stories so that people can learn from them. And I think uh, these are very useful, I think, uh, uh, publications, I think, that they, they, they do. Thank you. And something that you would like to see more of is processing within the small-scale farming particularly in Africa, as you've been looking into. Yeah, more, so more processing and storing. So if you are a tomato producer, for mm. example, I mean, I can give an example. I, my wife loses, maybe I can say, say about 20 kilos each harvest because either the tomato is cracked. But if she could dry them, you would find that the cracked tomato can be utilized. So what I've done is, 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 a, is a scientist, an innovative scientist, I've built a... a a, a, a solar dryer, which we still have to test, of course, but we have moved to try to dry the tomatoes, then we mm -hmm. should be able to cut the, 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 the losses. We can't give the employees the tomatoes because it compromises on mm -hmm. sorting. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's, it's about thinking about how we can limit the amount of waste that we, we put out there. And those things could also people in the so-called developed world do, you know? Mm -hmm. They could use their food a bit more. Yes. <laughs> and not throw it away. Absolutely. Dry the tomatoes that have a crack, for example. Yes. Yes. No, from where I stand, I, I, I think uh, what I, I would like to continue to do is to uh, work with the new, the emerging, genera the new generation mm. of, of researchers and professionals and in any way I can uh, try to, to advise them and, and network them with organizations that can add value to their, uh, to their career plans in, in this area because we need to continue to develop that field. Mm. It will only grow <coughs> in the future.
Um, you know, dreaming of the year 3017, what we'll be having are urban constellations. There won't be any cities anymore. They will come to, they were glued together and through huge regions. So the very nature of, if we're still here, of course, but um, the very nature of agriculture will change. Um, so we're heading in that direction and uh, ev everything is possible. <laughs> everything is possible. <laughs> And also connecting the deep knowledge that <coughs> is within uh, developing countries, uh, I would presume, so that we tap on that knowledge as well. Yes. Well, we've, we, we mostly work at IDRC mm. with Global South. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. that's... Yeah. Thank you. Um, we work these days a lot on circular economy because feeding the cities cannot be just a one-way flow. We are living in a resource-constrained world. So we have to make the best out of the waste, like the food waste, but also human excreta and, and others here in the room work on the same challenges. Mm -hmm. And when we did a landscape analysis in this regard, uh, we got the big message that we have to look much more at the business models of these to make it really working, because in theory it all looks so nice, win-win, yeah. but at the end nobody's, nobody's interested. <laughs> and yeah. then we said, okay, that's easy. So we invited the private sector and we had a dialogue we didn't understand a word, because we researchers speak just a different language, and they speak about bonds and whatever, and it's, it's an absolutely different word. So for us, the breakthrough came when we integrated entrepreneurs into our research teams, mm -hmm. so that actually we could understand them. Mm -hmm. And I think if we go this way, then <coughs> it will be possible. Once again, an example of needing to work through different disciplines, sectors, yeah. sectors, yeah. sectors to yeah. understand each other. Uh, well, everybody needs to eat, obviously. Maybe that is a good starting point. They, they need to eat as well, the economists, don't they? <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, to build on that, um, I was at a meeting last week at Chatham House where they were looking at how do we achieve nutritional sufficiency within the world's environmental constraints. And it, that is the big issue. And we were reminded by someone with a sense of history that it always seems impossible until it was done. We were saying that about energy 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. We're never going to get green energy, central stage, business joined up, business mm -hmm. investing. Mm -hmm. We're in a very different place mm -hmm. now. It's not mm -hmm. just about Paris. It's about the mayors of cities. It's about private citizens, activists. Mm -hmm. But most of all, it's about mm -hmm. business applying mm -hmm. pressure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for me, that gives a lot of hope, but it also sets the bar quite high because mm -hmm. if we don't get it right and we don't move this forward, the planet's in a big in a big mess and yeah. a big problem. So, yes, it's not impossible. We've already done it with other really important issues of the day. Mm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. No, I agree. I mean, that there are many positive examples and there are many opportunities. And what I think, I mean, as researchers, and it's a bit like being inspired by your presentation, Pei, where you try to do sort of a, a structured review of what are actually the, the really the evidence in, in mm. your case for urban agriculture. And I think that to do that sort of systematic um, and analyzing and learning from, from the positive examples from where there have happened the change to understand the drivers, the context and so on. I mean, that is what we as researchers can do because <coughs> many times it is like we have the primary research, we collect data, we heard many things from many villages, four villages, India, two villages here, two villages there. But to learn from many places at the same time, which is sort of a methodology per se, I think that is what, 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 what is needed and what where researchers can, can contribute. Because we don't really benefit from a lot of new legends. You know? So, so we, that's, we need to bring out the evidence in the stories, but also the context where this has been successful or where it has not been successful. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. again, we create mm -hmm. silver bullets and, and then we fail. So, so, so that is to, to bring that more holistic, um, mm -hmm. cross-disciplinary research where many people need to be engaged and stakeholder be part of the, of, of the dialogue. Yeah. I think that is what we need within different thematic areas that we could, could identify. It's, a, it's an uh, amazing challenge also for us within the media, I would say. You know, I've learned so much from listening to you here today. Um, mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Um, mm. Okay, thank you. I think we're on the same page. Um, uh, the most impressive part of this, uh, what people are working on here are, to me, were those people who were looking, uh, who were sh pointing out that 
the term organic waste is a misnomer. There is no such There's thing organic as results. organic waste. <laughs> There's just organic material that hasn't yet been ut utilized properly. So uh, I, I hats off to those of you who are working on the, the pee and the poop and putting that back into the crop, and the insects, uh, the um, use of black fly as a way to increase the use of compost. These are really exciting things to me. So I would like to end on this haiku that it, innovations in technology, institutions, policies, enlightened leadership. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> well, I think we got a lot, a lot of food for thoughts today and yesterday and uh, lots of things to bring with us home and out in the world. Um, often we don't talk about yeah. what, the, what the planet is doing for us, you know, what we don't pay for, the cleaning of the water, the pollination and all of these things. And a few years back it was a lot of talk about how do we put a value on that? How do we actually give a price to all of these things that is so beautiful and happening to, mm -hmm. to, to us so we can live on this planet uh, without us having to pay anything for it. But maybe finally we are realizing that we have to really look after this and you have all shown that it is possible. So uh, with these words, I think we are exactly on time. Mm -hmm. Now you're gonna mingle, continue to <laughs> talk and mingle and thank you so much for having been here. and for Thanks to you, Marika. Yeah. Being allowed to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.